celebrations to Wednesday, uh, June 17th. So um, we've been talking about kind of law enforcement and the recent events and where we are. And Pepper, I, I asked Gail to send you an invite after, because you made some comments this morning in judiciary around um, disciplining officers and stuff. And I'd just like you to, to talk to us about that also, because we were, we thought, doing a, a bill that would have um, done things that judiciary was going to deal with um, data collection and use of force. And then we were going to do the rest. So I, I don't know where we are now, but if you would just um, throw that in and anything else that you think of. And I you know what I'm going to do, since you guys are the only ones here with us, I, I'm going to I tried to go through my notes um, this morning and figure out some of the uh, things that we've been talking about and what might be ideas. And I will print them up and send them out to everybody. But just let me go through some of them. Kind of, um, there is in twenty in Title Twenty um, the ability to create um, community review panels, but maybe um, modifying that a little bit so that we could look at um, consider regional review panels and um, have. Uh, Human Rights Commission work with the Academy and the Attorney General to provide training to the citizens that are on those review panels. So that because you want competent people serving on the review panels themselves, um, adopt statewide standards for um, model model interviewing that could happen when you're hiring somebody. The criteria that we're looking for, both positive and negative. Uh, standards toward um, how you deal with stops, um, the release of information upon uh, substantiation of uh, allegations, more training on initial de-escalation. Who is it from the council that reviews allegations? Does that include a um, citizen at, or is it just law enforcement that reviews? Um, a review oversight of the academy, where where it might live, should it live someplace else? We heard we've heard that a couple different times. Um, all credible allegations re reported to the council. Um, perhaps investigate a statewide contract to purchase body cams and also for the storage of data because we know that that's expensive. And if they did it in bulk somehow, could, would that be helpful? Um, I'm just <clears throat> throwing things out here that have come up. Um, review the mandated basic training. For example, we heard from um, Sheriff Anderson yesterday that why does he have to have search and rescue training? Because he doesn't do search and rescue. So every time you have a training that is required, it means less time for other um, training. So we need maybe look at what is required um, the idea of not, um, agencies not being eligible for funding for grants if they don't, um, collect the data in a proper manner, and that's been supported, but also it came up, um, maybe an agency, if they're not compliant with, uh, data require, collecting requirements and, um, policies that they, don't have the right to send somebody to the academy. That came up. Um, uh, review the written re exams, oral exams, and psycho exams. Um, and the collection of data, and I hadn't heard this one before, but um, collection of data needs to be uniform within law enforcement, but it also needs to be uniform within all of state government. Because if law enforcement is collecting it in one way, and DMV and DCF and DOC are collecting it in another way, it still isn't uniform. So we need to have some kind of uniformity around how we collect racial data. And uh, I don't know if you were there this morning when Susanna talked to us, but she said it should be self-reported, it should be optional. And if somebody does not uh, choose to report, then it should um, there should be a disclaimer and a 
perceived racial um, comment, but that people often are reluctant to re self-report because they're reporting to the very system that's been oppressive to them. Um, review public records requests for body cam footage. How do we deal with that? Define bias-related incident reporting. Um, more use of social workers embedded in law enforcement agencies. Add Susanna to the training council. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of militarizing police. So those are the, I, the list of things and I'll type them up and send them to everybody so you can look at them. But, um, and if there's anything we can do, we will. And if, so anyway, those, those are some of the things that we've been talking about so far. So who, Pepper, oh, Allison. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are a bunch, there are a couple other, you know, things like your, your very good idea of uh, exchanges, which actually would be uh, good. I mean, some alternative training that, that would go to what uh, Curtis and Julio were both talking about in terms of building cultural awareness and, un, and appreciation of difference. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, it came up this morning with Coach about having everybody be, um, it's called... CLIA, COLIA, uh, it's the Commission on Law Enforcement Accreditation and having everybody in Vermont get accredited. Um, and I, <clears throat> I'm not ready to go there to require that. Um, it's slightly expensive um, but to, to do it and to maintain your accreditation. So I don't know if that, I went on their website to try and find out what the standards were that you had to meet and it just gives the titles. It doesn't give what the standards are under those titles. So I don't, I don't know how to find that. But anyway, so um, Pepper, if you wanted to just talk a little bit about what you saw and any of those other things and anybody, I guess we don't have many people with us today. So you can talk about anything you want to talk to us about, including your kids. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hope they're napping right now. They are napping, yes, they are napping, but they, you know, they're not napping nearly long enough for me to get through all those topics that you discussed. So <laughs> I'll start and I'll turn it over to John um, for some of those issues that you raised. Um, okay. So for the record, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and this is actually my first time, at least this year, I guess, testifying before the committee. Um, and uh, so, yeah, today in um, the Judiciary Committee, we were talking about uh, police misconduct and, of course, police, you know, public confidence in law enforcement is really the cornerstone of our criminal justice system. Um, it's foundational to uh, community-based policing models and, um, you know, anytime that there's misconduct, not just improper use of force or, or deadly force, but also you know, conduct that might not rise to that criminal level, but is, is also very damaging to public confidence. Um, you know, it diminishes the role of the criminal justice system. And it also, um, you know, sometimes even just the lack of confidence in the investigation of misconduct is, is also very much detrimental to our entire system. So at least as long as I've been part of the Department of State's attorneys, there has been a real conversation about changing the way, rethinking the way we do um, investigations, um, how those investigations are conducted, if the conduct is criminal, um, who's making charging decisions, who's going to prosecute the case if, it's, if the conduct is not criminal, how does that get transmitted to the public, um, and how does that get transmitted to the defense bar? Um, and you know, under current practice, there's independent reviews that are done by the attorney general's office, the state's attorneys. Um, if charges are brought by the state's attorney, usually that case is uh, sent off to a different county prosecutor because of the working relationship that, that exists between usually that law enforcement department and the county state's attorney. And so there's an inherent conflict there. And you know, we've just been 
kicking around a lot of ideas. And now, um, you know, with the commissioner of Department of Public Safety, um, you know, has his own set of ideas that we're trying to work with him um, about how to just inject more confidence, public confidence, transparency, accountability, consistency into this review process. Um, there's a number of proposals on the table right now um, that also include um, how to recommend decertification. I don't know how ready they are to present to the committee. I'm really happy to hear that you've been taking this issue up because it seemed like it was missing from the Judiciary Committee. And, and I just haven't been following what's been going on in this committee quite as closely. But I'm really glad to hear that you've been taking it up. Um, John, I don't know if there's anything you want to talk specifically about this um, issue. Yeah, I can. Um, again, for, before before record. you do, John, just sure. let, let me, um, when we talked about it originally between judiciary and GovOps, what we were going to do is they were going to take up data collection and use of force, and we were going to do the rest. Right. Okay. So that's, yeah. So maybe the data collection. Okay. Yeah, I get you. I, I, I'd be happy to speak about data collection um, if you'd like just quickly, because it's an area that I, we've been um, very Involved. focused on in the racial disparities panel. Um, that's kind of the cornerstone of our report is on data collection um, and also on the justice reinvestment working group. Um, you know, data collection was, uh, you know, essentially you know, the observation principle is real. When you start collecting data and start telling people, hey, we care about these data points, then behavior will change invariably. Um, and, and so, you know, when we're talking about routing out um, uh, implicit biases or explicit biases, when we're talking about use of force, collecting the data is a very important first step to knowing how to eliminate uh, those kind of implicit biases or, or finding out where those implicit biases are creeping into our decision-making. Um, we, the Department of State's Attorneys strongly supports um, data collection and the timely dissemination of data, of use of force, every single high impact, high discretionary decision point, starting from that first encounter with police and ending when the individual is released from custody, whether that's at the end of the police stop or whether that's from DOC custody. Um, what's, what's very critical though is, you know, we heard the racial disparities panel spent a long time with um, Professor Stephanie Seguino, um, who co-authored the report Driving While Black and Brown in Vermont, um, which showed racial disparities in traffic stops. Um, one of the big takeaways from that uh, from that conversation though, was that the data that's currently being collected under, um, I forget the statutory provision, um, but it's highly variable from one law enforcement agency to the next. By way of example, um, Professor Seguino showed us eight different ways that the various law enforcement officers are categorizing Native American stops. Some are using I for indigenous, some are using NA for Native American, some are using FA for First Americans, and there's five or six other codings just for that one, um, just for that one Native American. And some, as you mentioned, are uh, using officer observation of race. Some are using reporting, um, you know, self-reporting, and some are just leaving it blank, um, frankly. And then. Um, Another just kind of really important thing that she pointed out is there's this duplicate problem that she ran into where some law enforcement agencies are saying are counting one stop as one incident, no matter what the outcome is. Whereas others are using, if there's multiple outcomes in one stop, as in, uh, you know, if it's one person who's given a ticket, but then is later arrested or is given multiple tickets and then later arrested, that could be three, four, five incidents all involving the same individual. And the law enforcement agencies don't have any consistency from one to the next, whether that's gonna be one incident or, or multiple incidents. Um, so that has a way of exaggerating the data or just making it incomplete. Um, and then my last point on this is one that you mentioned, uh, Senator White, which is that, um, Okay, so even if you got consistency among the law enforcement agencies, 
you know, the state's attorneys are going to be asked to report data as well. And we might have our own coding system that's totally different. And certainly um, Department of Corrections has somewhat decent data, especially compared to our other uh, agencies, but they have a totally different coding system. And the court, the courts do their own thing as well. Um, and so when you want to track one case from the initial police stop and see it all the way to the end of the system, the end of the pipeline, then, um, you know, you just can't, you just can't track the cases because everyone is talking about a different thing. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I really appreciate this, the, what was uh, devised in uh, Justice Reinvestment, S338, which essentially said, and I'm paraphrasing here, and it was based on, a, I think, a Connecticut law that passed a few years back is put all these players in the room together, including members of the public. I think that's important. And figure out which data points you want to gather. Let's come up with a common definition of whether we're going to self-report race, whether it's necessary at all, whether we want um, officer observation of race. And... Um, track, you know, have the same data points um, and the same definitions follow throughout the entire system, starting with law enforcement, moving to the state's attorneys, moving to the courts, including the defender general um, and uh, the attorney general as well, who, who handles these cases, and then through to DOC. Um, and, until, and, and then also part of justice reinvestment is saying, what resources are necessary to, to do this? Um, which I think is an, a really important piece of this. Um, you, you know, it's just VSP, who's usually considered one of the best at collecting data. They have one person who's essentially doing this on her overtime, um, collecting all the data and processing it for CRG. Um, and that that's, that's fine, but you know, I just, some of these smaller departments, and certainly the state's attorneys don't have, you know, a lot of extra time on their hands to, to be reporting data um, continuously um, on every discretionary point that they make. Um, so I think that the justice reinvestment approach is the right one to do. Let's all get in the same, get on the same page, talk about what we need, and then, um, you know, start the data collection. Pepper, is it, is it important to, um also have the same um, standardized collection system for places like DMV and DCF and uh, that aren't part of the justice system? I mean, within the whole system, I can see that that makes sense. But is it also important to have it for those others? I think, you know, law, anyone that can be kind of a deputized law enforcement agency, which I believe includes uh, DMV um, and liquor control. I mean, it's in, what is it in Title 24, which describes law enforcement. I think mm -hmm. they all need to be on the same page. Um, sure, wildlife. But I was thinking even beyond law enforcement. Do, do we yeah, need you're, to? You're, think, you're thinking statewide. I mean, state government. Yeah, I'm think I'm thinking if if we're collecting that kind of data for um, for uh, DCF, I don't know if we do or not. But if we're collecting it for the for other agencies and other departments within state government, should we be somewhat consistent? I know that I, for, for example, I work for um, housing authorities, and yeah. they have on their form, on their application, they're, it's the categories, but I don't know that they're the same categories that every housing authority uses. So I don't know how you would, so is it important to extend it beyond just the judiciary, the law, the, that system, the justice system? It seems like it would, it's not something that we've really tackled in either of my mm -hmm. work with justice reinvestment or the racial disparities panel. Um, which, yeah. What's important about the criminal justice system is, and, and it, this is true of those other systems as well, is but you're really dealing with people's liberty interests. And yeah. so, um, you know, when you're talking about that level of kind of government intrusion, um, it certainly makes sense that we're not allowing disparities to creep into those areas. But uh, I, I can see how you can make the same case for, for housing, employment, um, other areas as well. It's just not it's been outside of the scope of our review on this, but yeah. Maybe we should ask them to look at that. 
I, I think so, because quite honestly, you can't fully have the whole picture of racial disparity unless you're also able to access uh, impacts on health, impacts on education, impacts on zoning. I mean, a, a whole range of, of, of things. And so it would be great to begin with uh, at least everybody under in the justice system. And if we could get that organized and in one data collection system that was usable, uh, then we could maybe expand it to the rest of state government. But it's, it sounds like this might be a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think Brian had to stand up and then Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. So James, I just want to try to understand what you said about that one state police person coding, if you will. She's coding for the entire force I, you know, the, the data is being collected by the individual troopers and then being sent to her to, um, to I, I guess, clean it up uh, for, because they report to CRG and CRG makes it public. Um, and yeah, it's just one person. Yep. And CRG is criminal records? Uh, cr criminal research group or crime research group. She must have uh, an amazing mind because I don't know if I could sit day after day after day and you know, but so to uh, the chair's point and I think Senator Clarkson touched on it too I do think it's important that we get some uniformity if we're going to bother collecting data we ought to at least be able to look across different agencies to to see whether there's a pattern I don't see how you could possibly understand what we're doing uh, in terms of you know traffic stops and arrests etc cetera, etc cetera. If you're using, it's almost like people using 26 different languages. Um, there's no way to say, okay, here's the problem and we can understand it because everybody's talking the same language. So to your point too, James, I think that's a great idea to get everybody together. Um, I was familiar with the 1050 coding that a, a, a law enforcement officer used to say if it was a fatal, there was a 1050 F, the 1050 I, if it had injuries involved. I assume that's all gone. I know there are two different systems that they use in order to uh, report back to uh, you know, headquarters, so to speak. But I do think we need to get some work done. And maybe it starts at the academy. Maybe you know, as new people come in, they say, this is what we use for reporting certain uh, data, and then go from there. And I realize it's kind of hard because there's, what do we say, uh, Jeanette, 82 different agencies uh, in the state, and it's hard to get everybody to do the same thing, but I really think it's critical if we're going to be able to tackle this. I, yeah. I have, uh, I, I don't want to jump in front of uh, Senator Polina, but I did, I did have just two additional points, but um, well, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was actually, no means I was actually going to ask you about this poor person at the state police as well who's doing all the coding, to tell you the truth. That was the first thing I was going to say. I'm wondering when, when the different officers go out and have incidents, do, are they using the same codes or is this person actually having to like um, differentiate between the various codes that the uh, officers are using? Like, would they all code Native Americans the same way or do you think they're actually different officers are coding differently in the state police? Uh, it's my understanding the state police has one system and that it's kind okay. of different depending on which department or, or local department or sheriff you're talking to. Uh, I, I just think this is, I think it's kind of really ridiculous that if we should have this bad of a coding system. It's, it's sort of a no-brainer. Yeah. So I appreciate you forcing this issue on us. All right. And, and, um, and one one additional point that, that I would make, it, it, which was again, part of our uh, racial disparities recommendation and I think is probably something you've discussed, and I think it was on your sheet or on your initial comments, Senator White, is that um, the trooper, the troopers are collecting this data, um, and it's really up to the next level of management, the sergeants and the lieutenants, to ensure that they're doing it consistently, and that no, you know, there's no boxes that are being left unchecked or, you know, making sure, you know, it's that next level of manager that's really setting the culture for the people, the, the ground force, the troops on the ground. And part of our recommendation is that anyone who's becoming a sergeant or taking any managerial role 
really understand the importance of this data collection, not, and, and it goes well beyond data collection. Um, also understand implicit bias and, um, you know, have cultural sensitivity and understand the principles behind community policing. But, um, you know, as far as getting accurate and timely dissemination of data, you know, that can, if, if that's the, one of the tasks of the kind of sergeant level um, troopers then, uh, or law enforcement officers, then it'll get done. And, and, it, and, that, and that, I think, you know, our recommendation is anyone who wants to be a manager, they need to go and get trained um, on how to do that properly because they're really essential to setting the culture um, of the kind of ground level troopers. And one, the only other point that I wanted to make with respect to either self, in response to Susanna Davis on self-reporting versus officer observation, is we talked about this uh, in our racial disparities panel. And um, it seems like you kind of want both because honestly, like the, uh, the way that an officer responds uh, implicitly or explicitly is gonna be based on his perception, his or her perception of the race of the individual. And so you kind of want to know what the officer was thinking, um, the, rate, the race of the individual was. And, and then you also, as Susanna noted, probably want to know what the actual reported um, and um, race of the individual based on, uh, on the report, the self-report. Um, it, it's probably a good idea to have both. And I, and I know that it's a complicated issue. Um, I don't know all the contours of it. I just wanted to add that in because we did talk about that at the Racial Disparities Council. We heard from another law enforcement, kind of the senior echelon of VSP talk about why they used officer reported. So I, I think that um, the, but there is a, a section in the Justice Reinvestment S338, right, that, that deals with this, that getting people all in the same place and getting them all to do it in the same way. So, um, yeah, okay. And the, okay. and the kind of resources and personnel that's going to be needed to do it the right, right. way. So we're not kind of getting, you know, 35 different types of data and, uh, you know, we have, you know, the, the ascent, the staff that's needed to do it correctly. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Pepper? And Pepper, we, um, we've been doing our um, committees a little bit differently than um, we did in judiciary and then, and that we do when we're in, in the room. Um, especially when we have fewer people, it's more kind of conversational and give and take rather than you testify and then John testifies and then, so uh, feel free if you have something to jump in and add, just raise your hand and let us know. Cause um, I think we've, we've felt that we're getting more done that way yeah. using this uh, method. Of course, yep. And and if things come to you know your committee members' minds, uh, I'll just be right here. So okay, thanks. So John, do you want to? Yes, um, John Campbell, Executive Director for the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. For the record, um, thanks, uh, Senator, and also the committee for having us in today. You know, uh, just I think most of you all know um, that are on the committee now, but let me just refresh your recollection that one of one of uh, my former uh, professions was, uh, aside from disc jockey, by the way, as in the column, um, was as a police officer. And I was down in Florida at the Broward County Sheriff's Department. Um, the Sheriff's Department is down there were the chief law enforcement uh, areas. We handled most of the unincorporated areas of, of criminal uh, action and activity. So I have, a, I have a little bit of experience in that. And you know, I can tell you, uh, having been in that profession, to see what is happening across this country, what you know, how some, uh, first of all, how some police officers um, are are acting, it just it just makes you sick. You, you just you just want to, um, you know, uh, you know, be right there to um, to be with the community and to say that listen, you know, not all police officers are act like this. Not all police officers do things that you're finding. I mean, I, I was thinking uh, earlier today, um, you know, of, of all of the different professions or, uh, or 
stations in life that someone might go to where you see that there are, are uh, a number of people who are bad actors and you know they've done terrible things to people you know they've they've gone into areas of religion and to uh you know priests and uh ministers where um they have actually you know sought out that type of job because they have a you know the uh, a better opportunity for them to uh come in contact with the uh, people that they would like to victimize and you know, so I think when I was when I was trying to decide how I was going to start here, I, I think what what I would recommend, what what I feel that we should take a look at is all the way starting with like the hiring of, of uh, folks. Now, you know, law enforcement has been pretty much a quasi military type of uh, profession. That's why it's 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 been uh, geared. And the training goes that way in, in Vermont. Actually, you know, they have uh, you live at the academy for you know full time. Uh, in Florida, we didn't. We did a part time. And um, I, th I I know that there's and I've talked to officers who support that full time, and they feel that, that it gives a, a better um, uh, a better feeling or an understanding of some stressful situation, whatever. But I can tell you, been through a daytime academy. Um, we were put through many stressful situations and we've handled a lot of things. And I just think that when you're putting a group of people together, what happened? Um, my curtain fell down. Okay. So when you're putting, when you're putting a group of people together in a uh, closed quarters and they're living with each other and they're constantly being trained in a certain way, I think they develop almost a group mentality, which to me sometimes is not a bad, not a great idea. Now, again, other police officers or former police officers might disagree. Uh, I just see that. But I also look to, you know, who are the people we're getting in? Who are the ones that these departments are hiring then and then putting them through the academy? One of the things that I was really kind of shocked when I found out when I first came up was that not every department does uh, psychological tests. Uh, I know, I believe uh, Vermont State Police does and also the polygraphs. Um, the psychological test to me, and I, and I can tell you that I know several occasions, certain people who didn't pass the psychological down in Florida um, and uh, it, for a good reason. Um, you know, some of them I knew when they were in high school and they were the, some of the guys who were bullies and, and um, you know, I think what you, what you try to root out is you try to find, uh, are there reasons why people are seeking this type of profession, number one, or are there deep-seated anger issues? Uh, are, there, are there people who are seeking uh, positions of power? Uh, to get into uh, organizations like that. Are people there for bias that they feel like they're going to be able to uh, uh, go into a, a, a certain ethnic community and uh, take their personal uh, hatred out on those people? Um, these things, I think, all can be, uh, for the most part, discovered in a, in a good psychological exam. And so I would, I, I would urge and, and recommend that that be part of any hiring uh, process. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is just like with all the data collection we're talking and this is a universal problem and that is the cost. Uh, these things are not cheap. Um, it's the same thing with the when you talk data collection and you have to realize that it takes added personnel to do these added, you know, uh, tasks. Uh, so that's going to if we don't fund it properly uh, and completely, you're setting the whole thing up for failure. And then what's going to happen, it's going to, as far as I would say, uh, if I was in the community of color, if, if, if you guys really mean to that you're going to take some positive steps to end what we're seeing, then you need to properly fund it. Don't do it halfway. If you do it halfway, then it's not worth doing at all. So I think we have a good time, a good chance to do this both nationally and, and of course in the state. And, and one thing also I might add is that we've been pretty fortunate in the state. Um, I heard the, uh, the, uh, the was, uh, I think Commissioner Sherling or Secretary Sherling had mentioned about the number of interactions of Vermont police officers that had, and then how many of them involved use yeah. of force. And it's a pretty impressive uh, number that, that we did fairly well. Um, so then let me get back, uh, getting back to the hiring. So the hiring, I think that not only should have psychological, you should have also, um, the, you know, the polygraph, 
Uh, one problem that, and this will go into decertification, one of the problems that we have found, and I've seen it on several occasions here in Vermont, is that we have had officers that uh, were, uh, they were allowed, some of them were allowed to quit rather than get terminated. Uh, and then they uh, went to other departments. And if you're going to a, if you look at some of the small smaller towns or some of the sheriff's departments, they don't really have the money to be sending a lot of people through the academy. So if they see someone certified, they're going to take them. Um, there's one uh, department, which I will not name, but one department and that um, actually I was still in the Senate at the time. And I heard that they had hired an individual who had made some um, racial um, comments uh, that were uh, extremely disturbing. And they were, he was let go from that one department, but the other department hired him anyway, knowing that, but that, that's because he was the only person they could afford because they couldn't afford to send someone through the academy. Uh, that's really disturbing in my mind. There's another, there's another officer who was down in your neck of the woods who, um, uh, the, I'll just say the allegations were uh, being involved in drug use and drug sales and uh, covering things up. And he went to three departments uh, and he was fired from each one, but that again, there was no decertification. Um, so I think that a, a review, I think what we started and what you all, what you did, Jeanette, or Senator White is you know, with the decertification in, in Act 56, that was great start, but um, it wasn't, it's not properly honed. I think you need to go back and look and see what's working, what's not. To date, I understand that since Act 56 came out, there have been 10 uh, investigations for decertification and nobody's been decertified. Um, and as I said, there are several, you know, there's a few people that I've seen, seen uh, cases that, uh, again, from a confidentiality standpoint, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I, I don't think it's proper for me to be using who they are, but I think that these officers probably should have been decertified. Um, because not only do they, you know, try to find jobs here, but they also go out of state. And, you know, if, if all of a sudden they call and they said, uh, yeah, he worked here. We all we can tell you is that he worked here, uh, and he he uh, resigned on his own or resigned her own um, volition. Uh, that doesn't tell the whole story. So we have to make sure that those people who are uh, certified police officers, who not only um, do things that um, harm the public, but also bring discredit upon you know the police department, the police agencies. Uh, those people should not be in that job. Um, so, so I think, I think that's, that's real important to look at. Um, I think the, uh, once, you know, people get onto the job, we, you know, everyone thinks that they learn things all in the academy and that you're not going to change. And that, you know, if you get all that training, you know, that sensitivity training while you're there, um, it's going to stay with you for the rest of your career. That's not true. I can tell you that when, um, you go into areas and high, especially high crime areas, uh, and you may be the most sensitive person coming out and feeling that things are, are, are you, you want to handle things just right and do it without um, any type of uh, personal bias or um, personal prejudice. Then all of a sudden you get into a situation where set, you know, five, six, seven days a week or five or six days a week, you're constantly in a stressful environment. You're dealing with people sometimes necessarily who don't like you. Uh, you're doing things that people that, you know, if you're arresting somebody, no one likes to be arrested. But sometimes that that you all of a sudden develop and uh, you get desensitized and to certain things. And so whatever we do, we ever we find out, I think it's gonna be good to continue to remind people and to refresh their training uh, to understand that, yeah, you are gonna be in stressful situations and you need to understand that. And then when you do, here's how you need to handle it. And don't forget these lessons. Uh, so it's just, you know, to me, repetition, repetition, and it's training that you um, that to me never is is wasteful. Um, one of the one of the areas that, and I think all of you on the panel uh, on the committee know this, is that the so many of the issues that come up, especially in Vermont, where, where we've had some of the shootings, the police involved shootings, um, have uh, not all, but some of them have involved uh, um, uh, people with mental health issues. And whether it's a police shooting or, or a uh, trying to 
uh, control someone who has um, uh, has having a mental health breakdown or or let's say it might be from drugs, whether it be PCP or something. Those are, I mean, having dealt with someone with PCP who put four of us, four officers in jail, I know what a very small person on a very bad drug can do. And the, you know, you get a person who uh, later found out this person was probably a really nice person until he got involved in drugs. But um, when they, you're, when you're confronted with that and you're having to defend yourself or to try to subdue somebody, um, you, if you don't know how to handle those situations, or if you don't know when it's time to, okay, let's back off, let's try to see if there's another way we can do it, um, then uh, you're, it, you're, it's not to your advantage. So what I believe we need to do is, and you did mention it on your list, is we need to start getting more um, health, mental health care workers or counselors working very closely with our departments. Um, I'm on the, the mental health uh, advisory board that deals with, uh, that has dealt with um, interactions involving death or serious bodily injury between law enforcement and, and uh, people with mental health injuries or mental health incidents. And um, I can tell you that uh, it happens a bit. And one of the things that we are, you'll hear as one of our recommendations is the fact that we do have uh, our departments adding or that departments should add those uh, individuals to help the law enforcement determine what's the best way for us to deescalate or what can we do? Can we walk away um, and let them calm down or her calm down and know that that person will not hurt themselves or won't hurt someone else? Uh, so, uh, because the law enforcement, you, you can't be everything. And you, you know, we often are out there and you're the, you're the priest, you're the, uh, uh, the um, uh, absolver, you're trying to uh, protect people uh, you're doing all these other things. There's so many hats that you have to wear as a law enforcement officer. You can't be everything, at least not everything, and do it really well. So in those areas, such as dealing with mental health, um, uh, folks with mental health issues, there should be somebody specifically uh, trained and uh, assigned to the departments. Again, I have to say, because I know if anyone's watching from a police department, they're going to say, great, well, how are you going to pay for it? Um, and that is, again, the problem, and it's going to be the underlying problem of everything you do. Uh, every choice that you all are going to make is, I assure you, is going to put pressure uh, on, on departments or agencies that they're going to have to add personnel, and they're going to need to have funding. And uh, knowing how, you know, what's happening in our own department, where we're, you know, down six deputy or six, you know, prosecutors, uh, the, the, this is not the best time to be looking for for additional funding. So, um, however this is done, I think that's uh, a foundation that I, I would hope that that you all consider uh, before um, making the, the uh, actual choice to um, to start something. Uh, because if you can't finish it, as I said before, it's just not worth doing. Uh, it'll hurt more people than than help. Uh, I'm just looking at some of the other, one of the other things you met, mentioned, Senator White, was um, about the, uh, the panels, the community panels, uh, reviewing things. And, and, I, and I think that they can be good, but I would urge, and you, you moved from, you said, which I really like, that instead of local, you went to regional. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you support, but I can tell you, I think a regional would be far better because you take out the conflict of a local person or even the bias, uh, you know, it could be conflicted because they may know the, the officer yeah. uh, or it could be biased because they have gotten a ticket from that officer or something along those lines. Uh, you wanna have something that has, uh, that there's uh, the appearance of impropriety is just not there. You know, there's no appearance of, of impropriety. So I, I think that um, that is something. One of the person, for, I, before I forget this, uh, one person that I serve with um, on this, the mental health board, who I have found to be um, a quite incredible person. Um, uh, he's the uh, deputy commissioner of mental health now. Um, uh, oh my God, I just like, morning, Fox. morning Fox. Morning, yes, morning. Because morning has a very interesting background. Most people don't know is he trained law enforcement um, and I, I think, believe he trained some people from FBI also on 
um, uh, with with uh, de-escalation techniques and some things to do. He's he's got a very a really interesting background, and he would be able to offer once you get down the road a little bit. I think he would be able to uh, provide you with some good direction on certain things that might uh, you might want to um, undertake. Uh, so I, I guess I'll stop there and just uh, see if you have any questions. But I, I, I this is this is a, a problem. In a situation that we in this country are facing that it's almost like what I call the case of the yucks um, to the point where every time you turn the TV on and you see that another person who because of uh, his or her race or, or their color of the skin or their, their uh, religious uh, preferences are, um, is being singled out and being um, uh, hurt, being killed. Uh, I, I find it as a human being, I just find it so patently offensive. Um, but we have to understand that these highlights, while they're not, they're not really you know, enjoyable to watch, we have to see that that is happening out there if we're going to expect any type of change. And, and you know, there was another thing, and I wish I had I said this myself, but because I often had, had made the mistake of saying what I'm about to say, uh, and that is, I don't see color. I used, to, I used to say, you know, when I make a decision, I don't see color or I don't see, and you, Senator White, you've heard, heard me say this before, I don't see, you know, what you're, uh, whether you're a man or a woman. I just look at the person and are you doing something? And, and then I heard that uh, this person who was talking about it said, but you know what? I found out and realized and I was told that it doesn't, that's not the way to look at it. You have to see color. You have to see the 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 difference is there. You have to see what that person, the mile that you know what they're they walked, um, you know as far as walk a mile in my shoes. You have to see um, what they experienced and know that um, we're never going to be able to understand me as a white person. You and, and all in the um, committee are all white folks. You're not going to know what it's like to live as a black as a person of color um, and. It's, there's nothing we can do to change that. But what we can do is we can understand that there are differences and that there are changes that need to be made in order for us as, as a race, as a human race, to, uh, to actually um, further ourselves and become what we would all like to be. And I guess I close, and, and I'm not saying this jokingly at all, but I, I still remember very, very, very vividly um, when uh, Rodney King was, when he said, uh, I consider them to be incredible words. It's like, can't we all just get along? And that will be great. And it would be great if we can live together harmoniously. But in order for us to do that, we have to understand that there are differences and that we all need to do whatever we can to uh, make amends for uh, some of the things that, that we um, have let happen and change. I saw Allison had her hand up. So uh, thank you, John and Pepper both. I, I we, Yesterday we did talk about hiring uh, a bit, John. Thank you for bringing that up because I think it's so important. And we, Mark Anderson uh, talked to us about the MMPI uh, psychological test that I thought he implied every officer took, no matter what the agency. But, uh, you know, clearly that's not, necessarily the case that everybody takes it. And yeah. so I just would, at some point, would love to chat about that because I think hiring is critically important. All these, yeah. how you evaluate if somebody's appropriate for the job in the first place before we invest all that money in training them. Right. And the, the second is, do you, speaking of data, do you guys have any data on the mental health workers that have been embedded in uh, barracks mm -hmm. and, and in different police departments? Because I know in Windsor yeah. and Windsor, counties, we've embedded HCRS people in Westminster, Hartford, in a couple of the agencies. Um, and so I assume they're embedded all over the state in some capacity. Do we have data yet on how successful that's been? We don't. Um, I, uh, however, we have spoken, all I have is anecdotal uh, information of, that we've received and we had testimony of, of uh, some of the or, well, right now we finished up one investigation uh, that was a death that happened in, in Chittenden County. And um, 
clearly that was one we wished there was somebody there at that time who could have done, I think, de-escalated the situation. Um, but from that uh, and from the changes that the Burlington Police Department made, we understand that they've, you know, are using that. Um, and uh, so I think it's wider spread, but again, it comes down to, Senator, it, it probably comes down to a resource issue with some of the smaller departments. And the worst part about it is you can't, you never know where it's gonna pop up. I mean, will it be here in Montpelier? It could happen, which we know it already happened. Um, what, could it be in Hardwick? Could it be uh, uh, Ludlow? Um, you know, something, uh, you know, or if you know, find a small, a small town that just doesn't have the, the ability. And of course, because the state police are so uh, spread, you know, you know they, how thin they're spread and they don't have um, enough people that could respond in time. So I don't know, I, I just, it's really worthy to, to have. I think that the commissioner um, talked a little bit about that because there is a, a social worker um, embedded in the, um, uh, Westminster Barracks, yeah. and he talked about how successful that has been. And yeah. Bellows Falls um, has, or have, has had, I'm not sure if they still have it or not, The they seem to be um, gutting their police department, but um, they had a, an embedded social worker, and it made a huge difference. And it, the social worker didn't necessarily go out on, on calls, but the social worker was there to help them work with um, around cases where they might be able to, um, de-escalation isn't the right word here, but um, intervene at a point where you don't need to have yeah. police involvement then. So it, it, it isn't just having a mental health worker go out on a case where they can help de-escalate, but it's it's way even before that. And also working with the police officers around around how do you, how do you recognize things and how do you um, respond to them? Yeah. So the the embedded office um, social workers I think are absolutely crucial. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We have in Montpelier here, there's um, we have obviously a number of homeless folks that I hate to say the word choose to be homeless, but because I don't think anybody really consciously chooses, but due to either uh, mental health or substance abuse mm -hmm. issues, they, um, they would rather um, stay in the woods. Uh, anyway, some of them are very uh, scary looking, you know, that they, they have appearances because they haven't, you know, had the, uh, they haven't showered, they haven't, you know, they, they're scruffy looking sometimes because uh, they haven't had the opportunity to, to have, you know, be, be cleaned up. So there are citizens that are, you know, once they see them, they call, you know, the department and, you know, expect that, uh, uh, you know, they're concerned that, you know, a crime may be happening. Whereas if you had somebody that was like a, uh, and I think Montpelier does that they know, no, that's, that's Joe Jones. He's okay. Um, he's got some mental health issues, but, um, he, you know, he is safe. You are safe and you don't need to have, um, you know, someone come out and you don't need to report that there's, you know, somebody lurking around your neighborhood, so to speak. So, um, so those, you know, those are other, other advantages. So one of, uh, I'm gonna ask you to uh, elaborate a little bit on one of the things that you said, John, but what, when um, the commissioner was with us, all these days were on together, so I'm not sure what day it was, but he talked about um, the way the academy is run and the training and stuff. And he, he talked about, um, potentially even looking at something like, um, so you're at the academy for a while, then you have a residency. So you're out, you're out there doing, then you come back to the academy for more kind of training and applying what you, and looking at what you learned out in the field. And then you go out and have field training on the job training. And then you go back to the academy for a while that we don't need to look at the, the kind of- um, 16 straight weeks. Yeah, yeah, and I so I think that they are looking at, uh, and we've we've encouraged them in 124 to to continue to look at alternative ways of providing it. I, I think this, um, I I really like this this idea here of kind of doing it in chunks and having actual 
service and residency, like they do with medical school, kind of. Well, and, you know, you, you raise an interesting thing, a point here, and, and I'm just thinking about this. Um, I would almost like to see them, you know, taking, you know, this week uh, or forever how long you're going to work at the mental um, health facility and you're going to be right there with them, uh, with people who you were going to encounter. So you, to see, you can get, you will be able to see a different side of those individuals. You'll be yeah. able to see those, you know, the terrors that they go through. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to understand how they might react in certain ways. Uh, what are stressors yeah. for them? That, that to me would be, would be interesting. Um, I think any amount, any way that you can get somebody to, that has more understanding of especially when they're going to be dealing with people, you know, that you have more understanding of the people that you're going to be interacting with. In fact, just one last example, which was, uh, you know, for a long time you had, uh, you know, the, uh, the typical LAPD or NYPD with the guys with the glasses, the mirrored glasses, and, and, you know, they, they have to come across and a lot of these guys now they're big, big guys. Um, and they, I think they all went out and they feel like they have to be tough, you know, have to look tough and be tough. And certainly there, and I don't, uh, I don't make light of this at all. I mean, these are dangerous situations that pe- that police officers are, you know, find themselves in. But because they're, it's hard for them to let their their guard down because when you let your guard down, you expose yourself to potential danger. But yet there are times when you, you know, you should be take off the glasses. And if somebody talks to you, like, say hi, wave. I'm, um, it happened here in Montpelier. And, and you know, when I now walk every morning, like five miles, and I, I see a lot of the you know, officers, and I'll sit there and wave. Most of them wave back, but then there's some that just still make it look like, you know, no, I can't do that. And um, that's part of the mentality, you know, the, 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 that I think we need to break through. We've tried it and it has hap- worked with community policing, like police officers, get out of your cars, get yes. into, get on the streets. And that's, I think that's been, you know, fairly successful, but we can take it a little bit further. And, and I tell you what, your idea that I just keep going back just a few seconds ago to what you were saying. And, you know, like an internship almost, I, I almost think that that, I think that would be probably one of the more interesting progressive uh, things that could be done. Now, I don't know how it can be done and I don't know who's going to pay for it, but I don't know. But, um, but I, I, it's uh, it, it, another example is, you know, in Montpelier, they had the Black Lives Matter sign that was, was um, on the street. And as most people know by now that it was defaced uh, by somebody who was really more, I think more you know, upset with the government than necessarily, but it was clearly racist also because of what he did to one of the letters. But I had called Rory um, Tebow and I, and I said, listen, if you ever get this guy, you know what you should do? Because I was down there and Patty was down there. And Patty was actually cleaning off the, the stuff later that night. And I, I said, um, you should get that person and that person should come there and be on the ground cleaning up next to the same people who painted the sign and to people of color. We understand, you know, maybe that something can wear off to realize that, you know, you, the people that you think are so bad and that are so, uh, uh, that you hate so much, maybe you have more in common than you know. So it reminded me of, Chris Bray has a question, I believe, but this reminded me of, there was a, a Minnesota judge a while ago who um, decided that he was going to make the, the penalty for whatever it was um, relate to the to the crime itself. And so when he had DUI cases, especially those that had been, had been involved in an accident, mm-hmm. they had to volunteer, they had to do community service on a rescue or with a police officer to go to DUI accidents. Yeah. And he, the judge said that it, those people never did it again. <laughs> so yeah, no, Chris, I, did you have, yeah. oh. And Brian had something too. Oh, okay, I'm sorry down there in the corner. Yeah, so no, actually I I, I did not have a question, but it's okay. nice to see uh, Senator Camp, Senator Camp. Hello, Senator Bray, good to see you. I see Brian, you still have two eyes. Do you have a question, school. Brian? Oh, Brian? oh I, I thought, I didn't know if Chris was gonna keep going. Um, I didn't either, but. So I know uh, outgoing police chief Tony Fakus had uh, someone in the department that was a mental health, I don't want to say expert, but 
who had experience in mental health. And from what I can remember, and I think he came in and testified to us a couple of times, John, um, it was extremely successful in reducing the tension level uh, of certain calls that, that the uh, law enforcement folks had to make. And I know from being in um, the Wetland area, I, I have a chance to see this Project Vision uh, operate from time to time. And they also have people, I don't know if they're embedded all the time uh, or whether they're sort of like a doctor on call if, if a situation comes up and they're able to get to a, a particular location quickly. But it does seem to make a huge difference. I don't know how Tony funded that, and I don't know, to be honest, how Project Vision funds it, but I do think it's an important piece that we, sh that we definitely need to look at. Yeah, you know, uh, and that's one of the problems is the fact that, that they're not available, uh, you know, don't have round the clock. Um, and actually, we don't have around the law, clock law enforcement uh, right. for also, but um, it, it, it's it, you'd like to think uh, you would have them available when you need them, but you never know when that time is going to be. And and I come kind of thinking more about that. I really think you should have morning come in. Um, you know, maybe you want to talk to him center white beforehand, or I could, you know, um, but I, he's got just an incredible, um, a, a unique look at these things, and um, I, I think he could be very helpful in this. I mean, I, I was just, I, I, I was just absolutely blown away when you when you talked to him about his background and the uh, the number of different uh, hats he's worn in his life, over his ponytail, you know. Yeah, in his ponytail. Yeah. Um, Ask him about. Would you? Okay. He's got an interesting story about that. Would you comment a little bit on the um, a little bit more on the um, process of decertification or of sanctions about either of you or both of you and around um, how, who it is that should be doing those reviews and how they should be conducted. And then if we've had 10 investigations this year and no one has been decertified, have there been other sanctions or did they not reach the level? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know what they are. Um, so uh, would you just comment a little bit more on, on that process and how we could improve that? Yeah, the, the way it's currently um, goes, on, I believe this is the way, and I can be, I'll stand corrected um, if I'm wrong, but uh, that they have levels of, of, the, uh, of different mm -hmm. culpability. And so if uh, you could have a, you know, A, B, I think it's A, B, C. Right. Yeah. And if you have, um, you know, let's say you, you haven't been turning your reports in uh, on time, or you told, you told your, uh, your, com your commander that you were going to have it in by the morning and, you know, you decided to go out party that night before and didn't get it in. Uh, that's a lower level offense. And then you mm -hmm. could, uh, you, you know, there can be uh, responses to that. Uh, it's the the higher level ones where mm -hmm. you would see the decertification. And actually, they've decertified, uh, which I found interesting, is because I always thought it just started decertification only started in a couple of years ago with Act uh, 56. But I went on the site today, and they were they had decertified uh, other uh, officers back in 2011, 12, 13 uh, for criminal activity. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. So, uh, and then some for not keeping up with your, you know, with the mandatory um, training or something. But anyway, getting back to, to your main question, I, you, I think number one, you have to have some civilian uh, on there in order to have transparency. Uh, without it, it's just not there. Um, number two, you need to have professionals and people who are, you know, that are um, well-trained law enforcement officers who've been there understand the intricacies of, um, of the job and understand that where the person who does not know the intricacies of the profession or what it takes might say that should be, that person should be fired for that. And you'd say, well, there is a reason for this. Um, and again, I'm not talking about uh, behavior that's that is harmful to other people, but you know something internally that they may have done within the department. Um, you know, we face the same thing on what's called Giglio 
uh, Brady information, most of Giglio, which is uh, whenever, if we find that um, a police officer has done um, something, whether he's lied in a report or her, she has lied in a report or uh, anything that, that could be impeachable material, we have to disclose that. And that's, um, that's when I really opened my eyes a lot more in this past two years, because I've been trying to get that policy up and running. And we are currently, as, as the uh, state's attorney's office, we're trying to um, get a list together, but we also want it to be, um, you know, there are things that uh, police officers do in their private life, in their private time, which um, are not criminal. They're, let's say, stupid things that they might do, but ones that, um, should they be uh, public and as far as publicly embarrassed by, let's say they may have um, uh, been, you know, out uh, at a, uh, an event and, and, uh, and drank too much or maybe get drunk or uh, maybe there is something, well, we did, we had one situation where somebody <laughs> thought that, um, and I'm not going to be making my own judgment here, but if somebody was having an affair and they thought that that should be disclosed because, it's, you know, and, and it, that's tough because it, it doesn't really, does it go to the credibility that, that the person's not going to tell the truth about a case or about a person he's arrested. So it's, there's, there are those fine lines that you have mm -hmm. to take into consideration and ones that um, that's when you need the expertise of, of a, a, an officer. So uh, I think that, um, but then again, you don't want to have a paper tiger either. Uh, mm -hmm. decertification should be there for a reason. Um, I, I think that, and I don't know for this for a fact, but um, I believe uh, they may, there might be that uh, situation where if the person re resigns, then they don't have to go through the decertification process. In other words, they resign, fine, you're gone, you're somebody else's problem. But that's <laughs> quite frankly, that's when you need to have the decertification process. The other thing, if I know that um, you, especially with smaller departments, it's really tough because I, 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 I can think of three s separate situations right now where um, it was very difficult for a chief or commanding officer of a two or three per person um, uh, department to do eternal affair uh, investigation. And most of the time they'll give it to another department which that's what I would absolutely say you really need to, but still you even have the problem where um, does it, does the chief say, you know, you ever do something like that again and, and you're out of here, I'm going to send you into IA. I mean, they have to understand is that if there's a complaint uh, or if something's brought to their attention, they have to do it. Uh, this is, shouldn't, this is not a, you know, it should be a mandatory situation, oh, which um, I believe, excuse me one second, if I can just, <laughs> um, so I, I, but so I, I, without knowing all of the um, the answer with how the program exactly runs, I think it what it would be wise to for your committee to uh, take a look at um, what's happened in decertification since Act Fifty Six. Uh, call in some people that have um, you know maybe some especially smaller departments. Like how have you handled it, and what do you what do you think um, should happen? Uh, one thing that um, has, I think, is has made uh, we've made leaps and bounds in law enforcement is what used to be the old blue line um, theory, where uh, where police officers would never, um, if they saw another officer do something uh, improper, uh, they would never say anything. And uh, this went on for a long time. And um, I think that we are absolutely um, seeing great strides in that area where there are some great officers. And one of the ones that was that uh, actually I touched upon earlier was where an officer was making racial comments about someone um, and it was heard by, um, by a trooper uh, and that trooper um, uh, reported that. And you know, that does cause friction. Um, I had a situation when um, I, it's not like, I guess this is a war story, but um, where it was my first issue in a racial situation, I got called, it was in a new area that I was, I was uh, patrolling and there was a shots fired and it turned out it was a domestic, uh, um, a domestic event 
where a when it turned out that the uh, that this woman's husband had been beating her for for years and she finally um cracked and broke and she shot him and so the report was shots fired and um i was the we didn't really have back we, we didn't have two people to a car so i was the first one there and from the sheriff's department and i found the woman in her car in a parking lot and a gun on the um uh on her uh dashboard and i and i said ma'am just stop because she was crying she goes i shot him i shot him she says and she was going on about how he had been beating her i said that's fine just and i said just keep your hands on the steering wheel and at the same time a fort lauderdale police officer came up and he was on the other side of the car First, I'm upset because I really didn't see him coming up. I was so concerned about this woman, and it could have been anyone behind me. But um, the next thing I know, this guy took a shotgun and shoved it through the other side, the passenger side, and put it and hit her right on the, her temple, and and you know said, "Move one inch, and I'm going to you know the 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 something you'd see on TV." And and I looked over, and I'll never forget as I looked over, I said. And I looked at him I, and I mouth, I go, what the, and, uh, and he said, just shut up. This isn't your zone or whatever. And I said, I've got this under control. Anyway, we were able, I was able to deescalate. I was able to get the guy to pull a shotgun back. The lady was <laughs> more hysterical. So I ended up reporting that. Um, and as a result, um, the, the, the uh, Fort Lauderdale guys around that area were not going to be, uh, they got, out, got around that they were not going to be, you know, giving me backup if I needed it. So um, it was an area that I was tempor temporarily assigned to anyway, but uh, my folks and the sheriff's department said, you're not going to be on back there anytime soon. Um, and that, those were the things that, you know, you really get worried about. And, and then if you think as a police officer, hell, if I turn somebody in that I'm not going to have someone have my back, um, then that's really concerning. But now it's evolved to a point where I believe that officers, not that it happens all the time, and it clearly hasn't happened in the last few weeks in some of the national things we've seen, but there are many times where police officers are in fact reporting activity um, such as what I experienced or re reporting activity that's just, you know, they know is not right or is criminal. Um, and uh, those, those people are the ones you need to really get behind and support and say, this is a good cop. This is a cop that understands what his job is all about or what her job is all about. So anyway, I don't know if that addressed it if I just kept on going on too long. It's just enjoyable talking to you guys. Yeah. Instead of painting. <laughs> it, it, um, you've been cooped up for too long. <laughs> I have, I have. Well, we hope John you didn't. Gets, um, yes, Allison. So I think we hope that some of the work in our bill S-124 uh, will help the moving around uh, from department to department issue um, because we're, we're, we're changing that um, the moment at which those get reviewed by the training council. Um, and there are a couple other things in S-124, which we hope will help this situation in fairly substantive ways. But I think we don't fully address the de-escalation. I mean, we don't, that's a- It's a train. And the, the, de the, the certification, decertification issue. Can, can oh, I, are you talking about decertification or de-escalation? I'm decertification. De-escalation is what we want to train them in, but decertification, uh, we haven't yeah. done. I think well, a review I think of what you what you've done in the past two years, where you've come, and and to make sure that what I've said to you, you know, about the ten uh, 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 examples are in fact the case, and, you know, so just make sure that that's all accurate. But can yeah, I say well, one thing? Can I uh, make just yeah. one last recommendation? Is that I, I know that there's a lot of pressure on you and this in your committee, and also legislatures and legislators around the country to. Um, to, to uh, do immediate change. And the, the thing that I think I learned the most while, when I was in the legislature is that sometimes when we act in haste, as I said earlier, we get things wrong. And this is too sensitive of uh, and too important of an issue 
to get it wrong, we'd like to get it right the first time. There are issues like, let's say your internal affairs investigations. I know that some people just want to make that totally transparent and, you know, open and, um, uh, and there's reasons that they're not always open. I'm, uh, now there's, I believe in transparency, but there are certain things that, um, that, are, uh, that officers who are conducting the IA investigation are able to get from the person on the other side um, that they may not be so willing to discuss if they knew it was you know, somebody outside. And then, then they, the department is able to deal with this person, whether it be through dismissal um, or, um, or, tr or training or help, you know, things like that. So just whatever you do, I just would, I would urge you to make sure that you've heard from all of the people who actually are involved in the activities that you're either trying to create or that you're trying to change? Well, I think we've tried to be, um, to remove as much as possible ourselves from the, the rhetoric and the emotion. So that, um, because I think that that, you're right. When, whenever we um, pass legislation in response to a particular event or incident, we almost always get it wrong. And I've seen that happen um, over the years. Um, and this is a series of events, clearly, but I think we need to, and in fact, this morning um, in judiciary, Susanna Davis said that very thing. She said, you know, this should have happened a year ago or a decade ago, but, but um, it's better we need to we need to get it right and we need to hear from the the uh communities that are affected so in getting it right so i think that whatever we do um i i'm not sure what i'm not sure what we're going to do but um i think that we could do make some um steps in terms of uh creating forward movement without making absolute decisions, if that makes any sense at all. I think you're hiring, which Senator um, uh, Clarkson mentioned, and you also talked about is that the, the in the hiring, if, if you can um, direct, uh, make some certain changes in the hiring process and the, um, the things that are required uh, and again, maybe maybe there are department, maybe other departments do do the um, the psychological. But um, I I would uh, that's one of the ones where I'd say you got your best mm -hmm. shot at keeping out those people who do not belong in this job. Well, I think that the commissioner was very clear about that about having some sort of statewide um, uh, model for how how you interview people the questions that you ask the the um the both positive and negative um characteristics that you're looking for to either bring people in or keep people out yeah so i think that um i'm very I, i'm pretty confident that we could direct them to come up with some kind of a statewide hiring um, policy that would make it uh, so that everybody, every department or agency uses kind of the same, the same process and the same questions and because uh, that is, that is a problem. Um, I the federal government would decide to um, provide some actual funding. Um, yeah. Well, that would be nice. Uh, I mean, more about the administration, not the, we're very fortunate to have our local delegation, but you know, if the administration, if they want to actually ever do anything, um, especially for you know race relations in this country, it is to invest in it and to invest in your, 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 your towns and your municipalities and your states um, and let yeah. them, you know, hire the, you know, the or, and, and acquire anything they need to make sure that we get as close to, um, not a close, well, let's get to racial parity, so. So I, I'm just gonna, cause you weren't here the other day when um, we talked about the psychological tests, but I'm gonna tell you that they, they've been using the MMPI and he said, Commissioner Sherling said that um, they're looking, it's probably time to look at a different, um, uh, when you a say different tool. And um, for your information, 
every um, freshman at where I went to college in Iowa had to take the MMPI. And the results of my MMPI almost got me unaccepted to a state college. I can't so imagine we, why. Huh? I can't imagine why. <laughs> I guess they thought I was a little crazy. Oh, no, no. Um, Allison, I think that is an updated test for that. Actually, but. you know, it's just as we break down silos, uh, you know, we uh, one of the things I've loved about this, the silver linings for me of some of the COVID responses as we have been working together and really trying to row in the same direction. And, you know, it's a great opportunity for the Agency of Human Services, particularly the Department of Health, Mental Health, to partner with uh, the justice system and, and, and our law enforcement agencies in particular. And and work with them either administering this, uh, the, the whatever test they end up coming up with and figuring out grant funding for them. I mean, there, there are all sorts of ways we could work more productively together and use the expertise in one agency and apply it to law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, Anthony, did you have a well, comment? I was just gonna say, I think the, what we talked about before about <clears throat> integrating real life experience into the training is really important and it goes both ways. The potential officer would learn from working with mental health folks for a week or whatever it might be and they would learn more about him as well. So I think yeah. I really like the idea of doing kind of like internships as part of the training. Yeah. I don't think it should be costly or difficult to do. I think it's I think it's really important. One of the most important things we've talked about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. I yeah. mean, look at Northeastern. Right. Body model. So I'm going to um, just let you know here that at four o'clock, I have another meeting. And you can keep going here, Anthony, if you want to uh, keep on or. Um, Chris had something. Huh? Chris had something. Chris had something. Chris had something. Um, I had a question for um, John, and that was. We talked a little bit yesterday around the amount of training and you know we know it's expensive and it's um, a bit of a hardship. People have to be away for residential training, et cetera. But we were talking about how um, you know, sort of big a box that is to do your training in and that one of the concerns was if you start adding um, training sort of in response to things we're being sensitized to particularly right now, Will we end up sort of pushing out of the box other things? Do we need a that are equally uh, important, but um, just maybe not front page issues at the moment? So do we do we need a bigger tr training box? And and this internship seems like a creative way to maybe expand it. Well, you you've just identified one of the major problems, and that is. Uh, you know, like during uh, the last five years, I remember we added like two hours here to, uh, or five hours for uh, domestic violence training. And then we had added um, more training hours. And, and if you talk, I'm sure when you have the folks in from the academy, they'll tell you that there's only so many hours in a day. And if you're continuing to put this training on. And so if you only do, you know, an hour training or two hour training, what are you getting out of it? So I, but I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you could make a longer academy, um, but that would be, um, you know, tough. Obviously, on the you know the folks that need the people out there in the street, uh, it would also be tougher on on, on a candidate. Um, that's why I, I I don't know if you were here when I said um, when I went to the academy, it was in Florida. We did not. The only ones that stayed over were the state troopers. They they had the twenty four seven. Um, we had uh, uh, the academy was like five days a week, you know, from uh, mm -hmm. seven o'clock till till four, and uh, then you did extra stuff afterwards that you wanted. But um, I think, it's, uh, in fact, um, some of the folks at the academy probably would be better at, at at answering that question. But it is a problem uh, center that you that you have identified, and uh, uh, that's another one. Like I said, if if we yeah. if we just throw things at it. And we act in haste, right? Do you know? I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna take off here. I'm gonna oh. take off here. And Anthony, would you keep doing this as long as you want? And I'll send out a list of some of the things we've talked about with Betsy, and we can get our list together so that tomorrow we can actually deal with some um, concrete ideas. Yeah. Okay. But I have. I have a, thank you. Bye, Chair. Um, the.
question, my follow-up was going to be, do you happen to know, uh, Senator Campbell, on how Vermont 16 weeks compares to other, you know, other states? Um, no, I, don't. I mean, ours was 16 weeks also, um, but I don't know how uh, you know, the comparison. Uh, you know, Cindy Taylor Patch from the from the Academy it probably would be the best person to talk about that. Um, and I know we've had this discussion and actually Pepper Pepper might be able to want to join in on this also because this was spoke uh, discussed in the um, uh, the REDAP or the uh, Racial Disparities Board also about, you know, racial training and racial sen sensitivity, which is extremely important. Um, but when you think about all of the other things that you got to put into a 16 week ba uh, box, it's like legislation, you know, you know, we come here, we, you know, we used to have, have, you know, from January to, and you expect that by May 15th, uh, you had to get all those things squeezed in and, and sometimes things just fell through the cracks. So, um, and these are now um, so important of issues that, that we, we've got to figure out an answer to this. It's just not one that we can, you know, try to do it on the fly and, uh, or expect it to work out you know, by just because you're telling somebody to do it. Any other questions or comments before we go outside? Yeah, that's it. That's a good idea. <laughs> John, so it was really good having you here. It was great. Well, thank you. Too, yeah, but it was really good, really good conversation. Well, thank you. And, and if I can, if I can be of any uh, help, and again, I, I certainly I told you some, some things, but you need to hear from the folks that are on the street now. I, sure. You know, things are old stuff. So, um, but um, I just thank you for recognizing the importance of this and these issues. And I also want to tell you that the police officers that I've spoken to in the state, and I've spoken to many of them since this all started. And they are equally ready to have things uh, to understand. And I hope the Vermonters understand that, that Vermont policing and police officers um, are, you not, you are not the same as what you're seeing across the country in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Not all police officers are bad. Right, I hear you. Yeah. And we, Thank we you. that. But, yeah, I think we all get that part. I really do. All right. Well, listen, thank you guys, and you all have a great day. And uh, if I can do anything else, let me know. All right. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Pepper, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.